There was one more. It's a go live button. There we are. I think it's working. We're good. Great. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hey, everybody, I'm Jody from Maine Parent Federation, and I'm here with Dylan. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping things before we introduce ourselves, really, and get started. Um, first of all, thanks for joining us today for our webinar on special education. This one we call Education is Special, and uh, we are live broadcasting today via Zoom and on Facebook Live. So everybody is automatically muted um, and cameras are off just automatically. But if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll be monitoring that throughout the day. Um, the Facebook ones, we probably actually have to kind of leave to the end and then we'll circle back around and grab those because there's just two of us kind of running um, the show today. So, um, as I said, my name is Jody. I live in Southern Maine, North Yarmouth with my family. Uh, my oldest son has Down syndrome. And so um, he is kind of my lived experience for the work that I do. And um, I'm a parent trainer with Maine Parent Federation and have been in that role for uh, about two years now. Dylan? So hi everyone, um, I'm Dylan Campbell uh, with Maine Parent Federation and I live in the Bangor area. So my role here is I'm a parent trainer, um, just as Jody is, but I'm also a youth coordinator. So I work a lot with youth with disabilities around self-advocacy and leadership skills. Um, I've been with the company for three years now. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for showing up today. I'm excited to talk about special education. You guys sacrificed your um, beautiful afternoon to be with us, so thanks. So um, this is just a quick disclaimer that Maine Parent Federation is an information center, but we are not a legal services agency. So we don't provide legal advice um, if we receive questions that are too specific in nature or, or um, of a legal nature, we will refer that to the appropriate professionals who can deal with that. But our job is to um, disseminate accurate and up-to-date information for parents and families to make good decisions for their kids. And then today's agenda looks like the following. Uh, we'll start by providing an introduction to special education regulations. And then we'll take a look at the purpose and structure of the IEP as well as the 504 plan. And then discuss procedural safeguards and due process. Perfect, so um, starting off at the most basic level, all public education is provided by the federal and state departments of education. At the federal level, this is the United States Department of Education. And at the main level, this is the main Department of Education. So who oversees special education? At the federal level, special education, often abbreviated to SPED, is mandated by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA. Um, this office, uh, this act oversees the Federal Office of Special Education Programs. At the state level, special education is mandated by Maine's Unified Special Education Regulations. And this is often abbreviated to MUSER or Chapter 101, um, which oversees the Maine Department of Education of Special Services. I'm good, Jody. So uh, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is a law to provide federal financial assistance to state and local education agencies to ensure free and appropriate public education via special education programs and related services to eligible children with disabilities. Um, you will see in green free and appropriate public education. Um, that is often uh, abbreviated as FAPE and we will refer to that um, moving on in the presentation as FAPE. Um, just a side note that I would add is two of the biggest takeaways from this presentation would be um, to make sure that you have an understanding of what free and appropriate public education is, that's safe, as well as 
LRE, which stands for Least Restrictive Environment. And we'll get more into both of these topics throughout. But um, it can be overwhelming. We're going to present a lot of details today, but kind of the overarching themes, if you walk away with a good understanding of what FAPE and LRE are, you'll be in really good shape. So there are four parts of IDEA, and again, that's that um, special ed law. Part A lays out the foundation for the rest of the act, and it defines the terms used within the act. Additionally, it provides for the creation of the Office of Special Education, which is responsible for administering and carrying out the terms of IDEA. So this is the logistical um, bit of how special education is provided from the government. Um, part B and B619 lay out the educational guidelines for school children aged 3 through 21. This is where they declare that states are required to educate students with disabilities. And also this is where financial support is provided for state and local school districts. And then Part B619 is specifically the guidelines for children's age 3 through 5. Part C recognizes the need for early intervention, often abbreviated to EI, um, which are the services for young children with disabilities. So this is children birth to two years old, and Part C outlines the guidelines concerning the funding for that service. Uh, Part C also identifies who is responsible for child find at this age. And uh, we'll, we'll get into child find in a second there, but that's just essentially um, the fact that local areas are tasked with finding children who may have delays and identifying them. Um, part C also indicates um, eligible services for families through Part C of IDEA and identifies who is responsible for providing the services. So Part C is responsible for indicating who gets the service, what services are available, and which agency provides the services. And then lastly, the fourth part of IDEA is Part D. This is um, where national activities are described, which improve the education of children with disabilities, and it includes the grants to improve the education and transitional services provided to students with disabilities. Um, also, in Part D, um, provides resources to support programs, projects, and activities which contribute, contribute positive results for children with disabilities. And Maine Parent Federation receives part of its funding through Part D. So that's how we um, bring some of the material to you today. So uh, Jody had just broken down the parts of IDEA, and now we're going to move on to MUSER, Maine's Unified Special Education Regulations. MUSER is Maine's interpretation of IDEA, the federal law which enforces the rights for children with disabilities. MUSER must meet or exceed the federal law IDEA. The language within italics is the state added language um, where Maine has to exceed the service, supports, and protections provided in IDEA. So essentially MUSER is a copy of IDEA with Maine's additional um, protections added on. So the definition for special education as written in IDEA is special education is specially designed instruction, SDI, provided at no cost to the parents to meet the unique needs of a child with a disability. It's important to remember that distinction of SDI um, as um, specially designed instruction allows for the altering of a curriculum to be delivered in a way that is accessible to the student. It changes the actual curriculum, not just how the child receives the curriculum. So the acronym FAPE, Free and Appropriate Public Education, what does that actually include? So a FAPE includes access to specially designed instruction, SDI, conducted within all school classrooms. And this includes everything of all parts of the school day, including unified arts, physical education, music, and art. And then when determined appropriate by an IEP team, access to specially designed instruction can be received at home or other places like hospitals. And then a FAPE also adds in protections that includes services and accommodations. Um, something to add here, um, specifically on the bullet point, when determined appropriate by an IEP team, 
access to specific specifically designed instruction received at home or other places like hospitals. Um, right now during COVID-19, this may not look like what it would look like under normal circumstances. And so um, that bullet point, this whole presentation was written prior to the pandemic, we should say. And that bullet point is not specific to COVID-19. And so actually right now, um, schools are, are prohibiting their employees from going into places like the home to deliver services because of the risk. So, um, so just kind of a little asterisk next to that, that right now that looks a little bit different. <clears throat> um, looking at examples of services, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, consultations from specialists such as board certified behavioral analysts, Counseling service, extended school year services, also known as ESY, this is all included under FAPE or free and appropriate public education. And then accommodations, examples would include extra time for schoolwork, including standardized tests and assessments, um, also planned motor breaks throughout the day. That's a big one for kids. Preferential or flexible seating, this could be you know, uh, a, a child may learn best at the very front of the classroom, um, or they may learn best at the back of the classroom, but being able to have that preference accommodated, taking tests verbally rather than written, and paraprofessional support. Special ed can also include instruction for positive behavioral interventions and supports, known as PBIS, and behavior plans. Um, as a side note to this, we actually um, did a great webinar late spring, I believe, um, with Courtney um, Angelo Santi, who works for the state of Maine for the Department of Ed on their PBIS programming. And so for more information about that, I would definitely recommend you visiting the MPF website, the Maine Parent Federation website. And under the tab that's online trainings, you will find that workshop um, about PBIS. And it's really a good look at what that means and what schools can do during COVID to um, support students in this way. Um, special ed can also include instruction for social emotional skills, independent living skills, transition plans for adulthood, and vocational rehabilitation. Um, the transition plans for adulthood is a big one in uh, Maine. When you turn 14 or you enter your freshman year of high school, then every student who has who accesses special education does need to have a transition plan created, which attaches to their IEP. And um, it is essentially a document based on um, the student's interests and preferences and <clears throat> excuse me, goals for their future about what they believe or what they envision life to be like after high school. And so that plan will change throughout high school, but um, a lot of times the idea of a transition plan is new for parents um, once their kiddo hits high school. So, so that is all part of special ed instruction. So uh, the Individualized Education Program, also known as the IEP. Um, the IEP is a document which ensures that all children with disabilities have access to a free and appropriate public education. This document indicates special education services and accommodations, which will be provided based on the student's unique and individual needs. Eligibility for an IEP is determined by MUSER, Maine Unified Special Education Regulations. This plan is developed by the IEP team. I think you have a story here. You usually add in Jody. Yeah, um, so my son I mentioned, he's 16 and he has Down syndrome and he's been in the same school district since he was in first grade. And he has a buddy who has the same diagnoses as he does. And um, on paper, they present very much the same way. But really, the school has done such a wonderful job of actually making their IEPs, their individualized education programs, completely different and geared to the needs of each of those kiddos. And that's really how it should be. Um, it's not a one size fits all. And it certainly um, should not lump kids 
who have the same diagnoses or similar diagnoses together and just assume that um, one pass would work for each kiddo. So um, very individualized and um, should never, it should always be designed to meet the unique needs of each kiddo. So how does this all begin? Well, the school district is mandated to engage in child find. And child find is when a school district is tasked with finding children who qualify for special education services and providing access to special education for any child who lives in that district. A child who is homeschooled or enrolled in private school is still entitled to receive evaluations, but they are choosing to give up their access to special education services as this only applies to public school children. Um, so child find is the method by which states identify which students need access to special education services. The state requires that districts find and identify the students who have disabilities. Referral to child find can be made at any time and by multiple individuals, whether this is CDS, parents, school personnel and providers, um, all of these individuals have the authority to refer a student for special education eligibility. Looking at part C, which is birth to two years, diagnoses can be challenging to, term, to determine at such a young age. And so the, the diagnosis of developmental delay is acceptable to qualify under part C. And again, that's just birth to two. The areas that are considered when um, qualifying for developmental delay are basically all of them. There's the cognitive development, physical development, including vision and hearing, communication development, social and emotional development, and adaptive development. And at this point, it's not referred to as an IEP, but it's an IFSP. So it's an individualized family service plan, which is written for the child. And this all takes place generally within the home. And it's a plan which allows um, the professionals, the early intervention professionals to work with the family um, in a way that, that can meet the needs of the child. And then part B619, that's ages three through five. Developmental delay can still be used, but this is the, age five is usually the cutoff for that um, in terms of qualifying under that diagnosis. And then this is where we transition away from the individualized family service plan, that IFSP, and we, we transition to the IEP, individualized education plan. And this is also where we start to look at least restrictive environment for learning, LRE. And I know we're using a lot of acronyms. So um, one thing that we will do is we'll add to the chat box at the end um, a link to a booklet which summarizes everything that we've talked about today. We do have some publications based on our workshops which um, take everything and kind of condense it into summary form. And <clears throat> excuse me, and you would find all of these terms um, spelled out for you in that as well. Um, so LRE, that least restrictive environment, is not just about where the education takes place, but it also considers the who and the how. So it's a combination of location, programming and practices, and it will fluctuate depending on the time of day or perhaps the subject matter, the staff, classmates, et cetera. So LRE or least restrictive environment is individualized and does not always mean mainstream classroom setting. We typically tend to think of it that way when we say, okay, least restrictive, that means full inclusion, but there are times when that's actually not so. so for a student who gets distracted during reading in the mainstream classroom due to noise and activity level, the LRE would actually be a quiet place for that student to go and work. And then part B, ages five through 20. Um, eligibility is based on one or more of the 13 identified disabilities. Um, and I don't have the booklet on me right now. I don't know if you happen to have it, Dylan. I do. You do. I think it's page 13 or maybe 12. It's somewhere around there where we have the list of disabilities. Do you mind reading that? Of course. Um, so the 13 qualifying disabilities according to IDEA are autism, deaf blindness, deafness, developmental delay, emotional disturbance, hearing impairment, intellectual disability, 
orthopedic impairment, also known as a physical impairment, specific learning disability, speech or language impairment, traumatic brain injury, visual impairment, including blindness, and multiple disabilities. And I believe the other health impairment is yes. as well. That's right. So um, the student's diagnosis, in order to access special education services and to have an IEP in place, the student's diagnosis must negatively impact their ability to access their education within the general curriculum. And this is a really important part. So just because a student has one of those diagnoses that were on the list that Dylan just read off, does not mean they are automatically entitled to all special education services. I have an example. Um, so a mother called, and this, this was somebody that I was working with, uh, a mother called and said she felt that her son was entitled to, to physical therapy support in school because he had a diagnosis of autism. And she felt that his gross motor skills were interfering with her son's school day. And so she made a request to the school to evaluate and they did, they performed the necessary evaluations and found that in fact, his gross motor skills were not inhibiting him from engaging or accessing in any part of his education or school day. And so they denied her request to provide physical therapy during the school day. Um, she did not agree with this decision, but in actuality, the school was within their rights to make that determination. Um, they went ahead, they performed the assessments, they found, you know, whatever his gross motor issue was actually didn't inhibit him at all. And so they were not, they did not need to provide extra therapy in that way. So it's really important that parents don't go into the school, go into an IEP meeting, expecting that their child will receive any and all service. It really does have to be tailored to each kiddo's need and um, based on the fact that the diagnosis has to negatively impact their ability to access that day. Perfect, Jody. Um, so now we're gonna shift gears a bit and we're gonna talk about the initial IEP meeting. And the initial IEP meeting must be held within a reasonable time after referral. And at this meeting, strengths and concerns are discussed, which help determine which, evalu which evaluations need to be completed. Um, I'm about to throw another acronym out, and this is the present level of performance. So at this initial meeting, you review your student's present level of performance, PLOP, academically, socially, and emotionally. The team must meet at, uh, at a minimum of once per year to revise and update the student's IEP. Um, the purpose of this is to review evaluations and determine that present level of performance, PLOP. It's also to measure the progress towards the student's goals and adapt goals accordingly, and also allows parents and teachers the opportunity to provide updates on the student, as well as considering the changes to services and accommodations that the child receives. But did you know parents may request a meeting to review the plan at any time throughout the year to determine the goals and accommodations? So the goals are academic, social, emotional, functional, developmental, behavioral, and therapeutic. Whereas the accommodations could be sensory items to avoid or seek out, preferred seating, breaks, assistive technology, additional time to complete work and tests, or maybe an advanced warning of emergency drills. Essentially, the goals are the what and the accommodations are the how. So when the IEP team determines that it's necessary to perform evaluations, the school has 45 school days to conduct the evaluation and hold IEP meeting uh, to discuss results. School days are not the same as calendar days. School days are the days that the school is actually in session. Um, so school days where it's a parent teacher conference don't count, weekends don't count, holidays don't count. So 45 school days may be a lot longer than 45 actual days. Um, on the other hand, CDS has 60 calendar days. The parent should also receive the results of evaluations at least three days before the IEP meeting. Um, and I think you have a story there. Sure. Yeah, this is really important too. And um, something I did not know early on um, when my son was in school 
in fact, when we first moved to Maine, because we previously lived in another state, um, we had to redo all of his evaluations. And um, we had, for the first time ever, um, a psychological assessment done with the school psychologist. And um, not knowing any better, I had received a phone call saying, oh, the results are ready. Why don't you come in 30 minutes before the IEP meeting and we'll go over the results and then we'll join the rest of the group for the meeting. And I, I agreed to this. And um, during that meeting, I found out new and important diagnostic information about my son. And it was really hard to process that to even know what questions I had for follow-up. And then it was really, really hard to walk from that meeting into the IEP meeting. And so I was not aware at that point that I could have said, oh, this is really helpful information. I'm glad to have some time to review and reflect, but I'm not prepared to go ahead and, and move forward with the, with the IEP meeting at this time. And um, I will need three days before doing so. And so that is the right of a parent to have that time to, to do exactly that, to digest the information, to come up with questions, um, and then to be able to move forward with an IEP team so that everybody is considering um, the student's interests and what's best for them. Are we good for the next slide or did you have more on that? No, I'm good. Okay. Um, so we're looking at the triennial IEP meeting. Um, I do want to actually just add a minute here that at this point, there have been no waivers to special education um, put in place as a result of COVID. And so all of the rules and regulations that we discussed today in this presentation are still true. And so for a while when we all transitioned to um, virtual learning last spring and everybody kind of went remote and was um, stuck in their houses, schools were figuring it out for a little bit and we all kind of had a little bit of just a natural grace period that we were trying to um, figure it out. But, but really in terms of um, triennial meetings taking place and annual IEP meetings, all of those should be occurring at this point. Point. Um, most of those are still occurring virtually, but they should be taking place. So looking at the triennial IEP meeting, this happens in addition to the annual meeting, the IEP meeting. And IDEA, that special ed law, requires triennial reviews every third year. And this is the big one. This is, um, it usually takes longer than an IEP meeting. Um, it's where they assess if a student's needs have changed. And also the point is to determine if they continue to be eligible to receive special education services. Um, so looking at where they are in terms of um, just all of their progress with their therapists, um, sometimes psychological assessments, all of that is done for the triennial meeting. And then the data which is collected will help to inform the IEP goals. So the IEP goals should really be adjusted based on the data that's collected for a triennial meeting. They can be um, more challenging than a typical IEP meeting because it is often a time in which we are asked to reflect on all of the areas which are challenging for a student rather than highlighting all of the strengths and accomplishments. And really this is, you know, a necessary evil because it's in order to qualify or continue to qualify for special education services. And so um, this is a meeting where I would discourage um, student participation. Um, we do, as an agency, do a lot of work around um, Self-advocacy, Dylan in particular, does a lot of instruction with youth about how to use your voice and um, get your needs met. And part of that training, um, we talk about student participation within the IEP meetings. And that can start at, you know, as young as kindergarten. Maybe they just come and say hello to everybody in the meeting, or maybe they draw a picture and bring it. Um, but as the child ages, we like to encourage building upon their participation so that it increases throughout the years. Um, that being said, the triennial meeting is a tough one and it can be hard for a kid to hear all of these challenges being talked about. So um, 
it's my recommendation that that really just be for um, IEP team members, the adults and the parents. Sorry, I lost my way for a second here. <laughs> um, okay, so planning for the IEP meeting. The school sends the advanced written notice seven days prior to the meeting. And this includes a list of who will be present at the meeting. And it also states the reason for the meeting. So a lot of times a, parents, a parent will call and say, uh, you know, I need someone to help come with me to an IEP meeting. I need to prep for whatever. And we might say on the other end, okay, what's the point of the IEP meeting and who's going to be there? And they'll say, I don't know. I don't, how would I get that information? that actually comes to you in the mail and it's on that advanced written notice. And so it's interesting because a lot of times people think it's just kind of an appointment reminder. It's actually more than that. It will include the list of who will be there and what their roles are. And then it will state the reason for the meeting. So if it's an annual IEP, it will say annual IEP. Um, parents should notify the team of any additional people that they plan to bring to the meeting. As a parent, you have the right to bring anybody you want to the meeting with you, um, but it is great to be a team player and just give a heads up if you plan to bring somebody. Nobody likes to be surprised. Um, but most importantly, if you are bringing a legal representative, um, you must notify the school because if they don't have advanced warning, then they will most likely just end that meeting and reschedule for a later date when they can be better prepared to have a legal representative there. Likewise, you have the right to record the meeting. You do need to let them know. You can't do that in secret and you have every right to record it, but you do need to let them know. Uh, with a lot of these meetings being done virtually, they're being recorded anyway, but um, that's something that just needs to be um, transparent. So before the meeting, um, it's really important to do some planning. Um, determine your list of prioritized concerns. So oftentimes we head into the meeting and we feel like we just have so many things we wanna discuss or address, and it's important to really narrow those down. Get to your top three concerns and then plan to follow up at a later date with any additional points. So don't just come with your concerns, but also think about the possible solution paths and outcomes that you would like to see and discuss those with a school. So be a team player, right? Don't just show up and say, oh, this is the problem. How are you gonna solve it? But show up and say, you know, here are my concerns and here are some possible solutions I see to remedy those. And then as always, bring data to assist in any requests that you're making. So this can be any notes or evaluations from outside therapists, counselors, um, providers and progress reports, and the school does not have to base their decision on outside data from, from providers that you're bringing, but it's really always a good idea to provide as much information for the school and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to show that you're really making an informed request. And again, they don't have to make their decision based on um, third party evaluations, or recommendations, but it is a good way to prepare for the meeting and um, show that you're a team player as well. So you also wanna familiarize yourself with the IEP team, as in the members and what their roles are. So back on that advanced, um, advanced written notice that we talked about where it says who is going to be at the meeting, it will also state their role. So there will be an administrator there, know who that person is, because they are the ones who are able to authorize funding. If you decide at that meeting that your child needs specialized transportation, then an administrator who can authorize the funding would be there to approve that and allow that to move forward. Um, additionally, a special education teacher will be present. A mainstream education teacher is always required to be present. And then any therapists that are providing services to your child. 
It's also a good idea to reflect on any information that you would like to share with the school that could help to shape your child's plan. And so while you're not required to divulge any private information, anything that you think would be helpful for the school to know, again, to, to be a team player and to develop the best plan for your child is really good. I mean, if your child is having um, sleep issues because they're anxious about school, you might wanna let the school know that and, and have some, some provisions in place as a result. And then always come prepared with written questions. Um, as many times as I think I know what I'm going in to talk about, I always come prepared with written questions and then a written statement as well. Oftentimes we can get in these meetings and they, we can end up going down a rabbit trail and not even meaning to. And so if you come with your written questions and you come with your prepared statements, then you're able to maximize your time with the, the IEP team and make sure that your point is clearly coming out. So um, this helps to take the pressure off yourself to just make sure that you're you know, getting it all done when you have that written note with you. And then also pick out available dates to reconvene the IEP meeting in the event that you run out of time during this meeting. There's no limit to the number of meetings that you can hold. Um, it's nice to try to get it done in as few meetings as possible, but you should never feel crunched for time and you should always feel that you are able to continue carrying over that meeting until your child's needs are met. So um, as Jody mentioned a few slides back, before the meeting, there's an advanced written notice. Um, after the meeting, there's a prior written notice. And this must be sent within a reasonable time before the school plans to take or refuses to take actions uh, related to the identification, evaluation, or educational placement of your child. Um, essentially, the prior written notice is the meetings of uh, the minutes of the meeting, um, and this will be sent out every time before an evaluation, before changing your child's educational placement or special education services, and it'll also be sent out when a school refuses a parent's request for evaluation. Parents should receive an updated copy of the IEP within 21 school days. The IEP changes will be implemented within 30 calendar days of the IEP meeting. Um, again, the school days and the calendar days come in play. So the IEP changes sometimes may be implemented before an updated copy is even received. So let's look at 504 plans. Um, 504 plans are different documents than the IEP plans, and they are intended to help a student access general curriculum by building in supports and accommodations. So that is different than altering the curriculum, but that's saying they will help through accommodations and supports the student to access the general curriculum. And 504 plans are not actually a part of special education services. So we actually call it a 504 plan because it refers to section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, part of the ADA, and uh, allows for the provision of these plans based on civil rights. So it's the idea that a disability should not inhibit a person from receiving FAPE, again, free and appropriate public education. 504 plans allow for changes to the environment that will remove barriers for a student to access their education. So again, unlike specially designed instruction where the curriculum itself is modified, a 504 plan does not alter the curriculum, but rather it changes the method by which it is delivered or received to give the student full access to it. So my son who has an intellectual disability, his reading curriculum is in fact altered to a grade level that he can comprehend and work from. But another student who may have um, some challenges in the area of reading, but may be able to stay on their own grade level, may not need the curriculum actually to be altered, but may just need some supports around how to receive the lessons. And so that's kind of the difference, a practical difference between um, IEP special ed service and a 504 plan accommodation. So 504 plans 
Again, I just said that they don't provide specially designed instruction. Um, but what they may include is extra time to complete assignments or take tests, specified seating, help with organizing or managing timelines for assignments, assistive technology. And again, we looked at that slide in the beginning of the workshop where we listed out a bunch of accommodations. All of those kinds of things could be within a 504 plan to help support a student. There is no standard form or document for 504 plans. So unlike an IEP where there is a standard form for each state, so you can find um, the main um, one at, at DOE, at the Department of Ed website, um, there is not a standard form for 504 plans. Each school does have the ability to devise their own plans. What is standard practice, though, is that each school will have a 504 coordinator. So each school has somebody who is designated to oversee the development and implementation of a 504. Schools are also not required to invite parents to participate in developing the plan or making small changes to it. So unlike the IEP, where a family member, a parent, is a team member, um, that's not true in a 504 plan. Schools do have to notify parents if they are performing evaluations or identifying new diagnoses, but they can move forward with 504 plans without the parent involvement. So in the real world, violations can occur. Um, so what do you do when that happens? So they're the procedural safeguards in due process. Um, the school is required by IDEA to provide a notice of procedural safeguards to the parents of students who have disabilities. This is a document that outlines the parents' rights when working with the school. It does not address the structure of the IEP or 504 plan, but rather it sets the rules for the proper procedures moving forward. So when you're addressing disputes using procedural safeguards in due process, um, the, one of the first options um, routes you can go is filing a complaint with the state. And this may be fi filed by either a parent or organization and alleges that there was a violation of IDEA within the school. At this point, a complaint investigator is assigned and they will examine the proposed violation. Uh, there is no appeal process for the complaint, but if either party is unhappy with the outcome, they may, they may proceed with mediation and or due process. So essentially at this point, the complaint investigator um, determines whether there was a violation made and whatever their, the result comes from that um, is the result that happens in this set. The other route or option of moving forward is mediation. And this is another process of resolving conflict by which both parties, the parents and the school agree to participate. A mediator is assigned and both the parents and school present their perspectives to them, as well as participate in discussions about ways to resolve their opposing views. Again, there is no appeal process for mediation, but the agreement is considered to be legally binding. If an agreement cannot be met, um, parents can move forward with due process. So think of the mediator as an impartial third party who can independently hear both sides of the story and help everyone reach a common good, a common ground solution. The third and final um, and most serious option is due, due process. And due process is the hearing um, by which a dispute may be resolved. Um, it's an actual court hearing in front of a judge um, and it's much more serious than the other two um, routes we just talked about. So a written complaint requesting due process may be filed to the main department of education by either the parent or the school district. If both parties do not choose to resolve the dispute by participating in mediation, a resolution meeting is required. There will be a hearing officer assigned to the meeting and they are tasked with the responsibility of determining if a violation has occurred and how, violent, how the violation must be remedied. At this point, there is an appeal process if the finding is not acceptable to the parties involved. So wrapping up, and then we'll go and look at questions and comments. Um, a big takeaway, and we started with this one too, every student is entitled to a free and appropriate public education for to his faith. 
An IEP is written to meet the needs of each individual student, and this should truly be individualized based on not just a diagnosis, but who the student is, what their needs are. And if the student, sorry, if the school and parents cannot agree upon appropriate outcomes, there are effective ways to resolve the disputes. And as always, Maine Parent Federation is here to help. So contact us with any questions or concerns. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about yet is that we have a program called Family Support Navigator Program in which we take experienced parents of children who have disabilities or special health care needs, and we train them to provide direct support to other parents. And a lot of the work that they do surrounds special education, and they can help you prep for IEP meetings, they can attend IEP meetings with you, and they can coach you on how to navigate the systems and best get your child's needs met. And so, um, that's, it's a free program. Um, there's no qualifying eligibility criteria. Um, all you need to do is contact us and fill out a one page application um, to have a match made. So um, that's a great way to kind of take the concepts that we talked about today in the workshop and get a, a more close up look at your specific um, circumstances and to be able to um, get some individualized guidance. A um, couple other resources here, some, some groups that we collaborate with a fair amount, Disability Rights Maine, which is our um, state's protection and advocacy agency, Autism Society of Maine as well, and then Gear Parent Network. Um, we all cross uh, refer to each other. We all have our areas of specialty and expertise, and so we collaborate with them a lot. And then here is how um, you can find us. You can find us, um, our 800 number, our website, and then through all of our social media channels as well. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we can look to the boards here for some comments and questions. Let's see, let's see on Zoom here. Um, so we have a question from Angie. What happens in the case of an IEP uh, in the case, case of an IEP meeting happening and the school not informing the parent? Okay, so for example, my son switched schools. We've had had an annual IEP review just before school started. The school stated that they would let me know when we could get this meeting. I got a Facebook message from my son's teacher about a week later asking if she could call me to discuss what was decided at his IEP meeting the day before. I was never even informed of the meeting, but they passed the blame on to a new special ed secretary for getting to call me. What has to happen then? Yes, okay, so um, that's a bit of an issue, <laughs> to be blunt. Um, yes, a parent has a right to be informed of an upcoming IEP meeting and they have the right to attend. So if a meeting was held without parent knowledge and without parent permission, um, I would go back to the special ed administrator um, and I would request that that meeting take place again with your involvement as a parent, at your right as a parent. And so um, I would also make sure in that meeting and actually prior to that meeting, in the email to the administrator when you request the meeting take place again, I would make sure that you place in writing that you never received any advance notice and that therefore you are requesting that the school um, redo the IEP meeting. And then again, while you're at the IEP meeting, I would state that clearly, maybe even bring that in a written statement so that that also is included in um, those minutes that um, that Dylan talked about earlier. And so um, that that's recorded officially. And so that's a starting place for that. Um, if you were to request the meeting and be denied, that would be a whole different avenue that you would have to take on. And I would say reach out to us <laughs> um, if that were to occur. Um, 
Jessica asks, if a parent wants to connect with a family support navigator, how quickly does that happen? Um, so it's just a quick one page application and they can either email it back, fax it back or snail mail it back to our offices. And then we have a coordinator who makes a match with um, a, a family support navigator. We call them FSNs and find somebody um, who can assist that family. Um, a family will get a call from us, from Maine Parent Federation, within the first 48 hours of us receiving the application. And then um, at this point, I'm not sure how quickly the matches are made, but there's, there's not a wait list. I mean, this is a real time kind of thing. We just trained a new batch of family support navigators. I guess probably two weeks ago, they finished training with us. Um, and so it's, there, there shouldn't be a wait list for this kind of thing. It should happen pretty quickly. Um, and then uh, Daniel says, hope to add Pine Tree Legal Assistance Kids Legal Project into that collab collaboration mix as well. Sounds great. Yeah, follow up with us. Um, I am going to make sure, I'm gonna put our email addresses in the chat box. Dylan, if you want to do yours. And then um, it looks like we've got another question. Nope, it popped up twice for some reason on my screen. Um, there are no questions. On no questions on Facebook? Okay. Um, do you mind grabbing the um, booklet PDF and putting the link to that in here? Or is that already in here? Um, can find it. Is it on our website? Okay. It's not. I checked beforehand. So another uh, tidbit of information, we're actually in the process of redoing our website. And so um, not all of our resources are up there to date. So um, we'll pop it into the chat box. But as I mentioned before, we do have a booklet that summarizes today's workshop. And uh, we're also happy to mail those out to anybody who would like copies of those or um, to parents who are unable to attend our workshops or webinars. It's a, a nice kind of supplemental resource as well. I'm not able to send a file, Jody. Oh, okay. All right. If anybody would like the, <laughs> the booklet, um, please feel free to reach out to us via email afterwards and we'll make sure that you get that. Um, also, if you wouldn't mind, we have a very quick eight question multiple choice poll for you to take. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch that because we are a grant funded nonprofit. We rely on your feedback um, and the information we collect from these events to um, secure our funding. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. We will stay here and continue to take any questions or comments while you guys are filling that out as well. We really appreciate you guys joining us this afternoon and um, keep tabs on our Facebook page because that's where we um, post most of our upcoming, well, all of our upcoming events. Um, I know we have several other webinars booked over the next month that Dylan and I will be presenting online um, as well as um, a youth group that Dylan runs and a parent support group that's happening twice a month as well. And if anybody would like to be added to our um, email address list, our listserv, um, we send out once a month a list of all our events for that month as well. So just reach out to us via email or um, pop something in the chat box if you would like to be added to any of that. 
We're almost done. We've almost, we've got almost all the pools done at this point. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. We got 100% back, that's awesome. Thank you so much, guys. And um, do we have more questions here? Nope. Okay. All right, cool. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope to connect with you guys again in the future. Thanks, everyone.